Okay, so it is about time to start. Um, so, hi everybody, thanks for attending. I'm Diego Rondini of Kinetics, and I will be talking about uh, orchestrated Android style system upgrade for embedded Linux. Um, uh, if you want to download the slide, they are already there on the ELC website, so if you need any information or if you just skip something, just load it. Okay, so um, in other words, we are um, talking about our experience with um, managing uh, and rolling out software updates on embedded Linux in a similar way that Android does. So we will see why we wanted to do that way, so why we wanted to bring um, how Android works on embedded Linux. Um, we will have a discussion uh, about how Android does over-the-air over the updates. Uh, we will see the softwares, uh, so the pieces that we are, have found uh, to fit well um, in our design, um, both on the device side and on the cloud side. So we wanted to uh, have a remote uh, management of the updates. And we will see also the changes and the addition that we have done on the, to the software and how we made it all work together. And last, we will have a brief demo showing uh, practically how this all works. So why did we do that? Um, we wanted uh, a system uh, on Linux uh, to update SOC devices, so mostly ARM boards. Um, we wanted to the installation to be atomical, and we wanted to track several information about the devices, and we wanted to be able uh, to manage um, the informations that the device can provide. So uh, we will see more on that later, but yeah, uh, we basically wanted uh, uh, an update system like Android. So. Um, we used the boundary devices Nitrogen 6 um, for our work, but it's just reference. Uh, it's just that there are some implementation details that are useful to us, but our platform should work with any um, likely ARM board device. Maybe some small changes will need to be made, but um, we use that because it uses i.mx6 uh, platform, so it's very widespread on embedded devices. Um, it has a special thing that it has U-boot on SPI nor Flash. So uh, even if, you're, if you don't have your micro SD card on, uh, it boots and you can use the bootloader. And the other thing is that uh, we use two separate partitions, one for boot and one for root, which is quite typical on embedded. Uh, we must mention that we refer to the traditional single copy over the air updates approach of Android uh, because recent devices have been have started to use uh, double copy. So we refer to the single copy. Um, basically uh, devices, Android smartphones that have more storage can use double copy. Um, what we wanted to do was to have uh, the biggest freedom uh, to access storage. So we wanted to be able to write almost anything on our device, not just update the rootfs. Uh, and of course, we wanted to run in Linux because it has additional facilities with respect to, say, for example, U-boot. So let's see for a second how Android does updates in single copy. Um, Basically, you have two steps. Um, the first step is the preparation of the upgrade. So uh, you run in the 
uh, regular OS, which is what you usually use uh, on your smartphones. And then the device is rebooted to a special system, which is the recovery OS. Uh, here is how it works. Uh, so, as I said, you are in the regular OS, and then you get rebooted to the uh, special recovery OS, uh, which basically has one binary, which is able to uh, read your uh, update file. Uh, it, unpack it verifies it, it unpacks it, and then runs several uh, binaries and scripts. So here is in more detail how it works. So uh, yeah, the device, the smartphone, for example, but it works even if you are using embedded Android, uh, registered to the cloud. Um, when an update is available, uh, you get the notification on the device. So uh, you uh, approve um, the download. So uh, if you maybe want to download later, um, and finally, when everything is ready, you get the question if you want to uh, actually install. So go, go ahead and install. Uh, the nice thing about Android is that it already has APIs to manage that. So uh, there's um, an API which allows you to uh, verify your update package before you install, so before you reboot to the special purpose recovery OS. Uh, and also, it has another API uh, which tells the system to install the file. So it writes a special file that instructs the recovery OS to install that update file. So um, in the platform that we have use, been using, um, uh, the bootstrap lo looks for the reset codes to decide how to, uh, when to start the recovery mode. Uh, when the recovery mode is started, um, uh, a RAM disk is started, and the init system of Android um, starts the recovery binary, which, uh, as I said before, verifies your package, uh, your update file, and it extracts it and it loads the update binary. So the update binary reads your updater script, which is uh, wrote in a special language, which is Android specific, which is called Edify. And while it is running, it saves uh, what it has performed in a log file. When it's finished, it, of course, it's, it returns to the regular OS. Um, yeah, this is how uh, the i.mx6 platform manages uh, uh, the, the selection of the, uh, of the recovery system. So uh, when a special register, which is the one of the reset codes, is read, it selects if, if the value is the one that you want. It starts with the second partition, which is the one that is used in Android for the recovery system. So uh, what is good um, about this approach is that it is quite small. So the recovery system is very small. And you can still run in the main OS. So you can. Uh, have the Wi-Fi, for example, com configured by the user, and you can access the APIs, so you can check if the battery is low, of course, on smartphones, uh, but you can check also the kind of connection you are using, so if you want to actually download the file or the update file or not. Um, the, other, the other good point is that um, the recovery system has no need to access network, so it can be very minimal, read-only, and isolated because everything is, prefer is, is uh, prepared before applying the update. Um, so 
let's look at the two approaches um, that are the most widespread to applied uh, software updates. Uh, the double copy requires you to have two copies of what you want to update. And generally, you want to update everything except uh, the user data. So uh, there are approaches that just update. Um, there are ways to implement the double copy by just uh, updating the rootFS, but you probably want to also update the kernel. Um, you need to cooperate with the bootloader here to decide which is the system that is active. So um, you have one copy that is inactive and the other one that is active. And uh, when you do the update, you want to switch from one to the other. Uh, the single copy on the other side has just one copy of your system. And uh, it has a special, as we have seen before, it has a special system which is just for the upgrades. Uh, in this case, what uh, you need to do with the, the bootloader is decide uh, if you want to go in update mode, so you, if you want to start your uh, recovery system. Uh, this is an example um, of a good implementation of the double copy. Uh, here you can see that we have not only the root partition doubled, but also the boot partition. So you have uh, that's an example, of course, but you have your boot script, your device tree, uh, DGB files, I mean, and the kernel and eventual RAM disks. So you have two copies even of the uh, boot partition. And I think this is a good uh, approach because if you, um, like in this other example, if you leave out uh, the, the boot partition, you risk that you don't have a copy of your boot partition because um, this is a, doesn't have a clear policy to update your boot partition. You can s easily switch from uh, one root fast to the other, but you don't have a clear policy to update the boot partition. Uh, this is uh, a diagram that shows a simple approach uh, to start with single copy. Uh, it is very basic, but if you want to start to play with a single copy uh, approach, I it is easy because you start with your um, regular embedded o Linux OS. So you have the boot partition and the rootFS partition and just add the special system recovery. So you have the recovery RAM disk added here. And you, when you select on the bootloader, what you want to do, uh, you're just actually telling use the same device tree, use the same kernel as the regular system, but then load my system recovery RAM disk instead of, um, of loading and mounting the rootFS partition. Okay, so let's see what's good about double copy, uh, which is used uh, in several systems. Uh, the main point is that it has fallback in case of failure. So if s for some reason, for example, power outage, um, the installation of the update fails, you just don't switch to the new system. You wait to have completed the operation. Uh, and it's also easier to implement with respect, with respect to the single copy. Uh, because it's symmetrical. Um, the, the bad thing about double copy is that it's very expensive in terms of, stor in terms of storage. Uh, so if you have a lot of user data, um, you, you probably want to choose this one because your system probably is small. But if the application that you're running on the device uh, is quite big, so the rootFS and the applications included that you want to update are big, you have the size of your storage. So if you, for example, are running uh, an embedded device with four gigabytes of RAM or eight, uh, sorry, four gigabytes of eMMC or uh, eight gigabytes, you have half. 
um, also you need to be careful when you have two copies of boot and root partition because you don't want to mix those. So you don't want to use boot partition one with rootfs2 and the other way around. So you need to update the copies together. Um, what's good uh, about the single copy approach is that it takes uh, very little space. So uh, you can create a recovery um, system which fits something like 10 megabytes. You don't need that much. Uh, and that's all you need to do, and you need to have to update your system. Also, the other positive thing is that you are running uh, in RAM. So you have nothing mounted, nothing mounted, no mount point, and so you can write everything. Of course, with the risk of breaking stuff, you can even overwrite your um, your recovery system. So you need to pay attention. But basically, you can even go as far as writing a new partition table and re rewriting your whole storage. So the best would be to have several small storage for the single copy uh, system. So you have a recovery which stays in a separate storage. And this is not always possible, but it can be done. Uh, of course, the bad thing is that there's no fallback. Um, so if you get uh, a power outage, the only thing that you can do is to restart again in recovery mode and try to flash again. So how do we, how do we uh, bring um, the Android style to Linux? So we want a system that behaves like we have seen Android single copy, but we want it on Linux. So of course, we have looked to existing solutions, and there was. Um, a big part of that it was already available, and we wanted to use uh, software uh, that already existed because this is um, complicated. So you want to start um, with known projects. Um, we start on the device side. So uh, a good solution for building a recovery system is using software update. Software update is written by Stefano Babic. Uh, I invite you to attend this session tomorrow. You should be here somewhere. Yeah, hi, Stefano. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I hope I don't make mistakes. Um, I will go quickly here, but basically you uh, have both a framework for installing your update file and um, demo modes to get, um, uh, to connect, for example, to a remote uh, update management platform. So uh, it defines uh, an update file format, something that is already available in Android because Android has uh, its update file format, uh, which is uh, CPIO archives. It has several handlers to manage, uh, and we can probably see better here. Um, it has several handlers to manage, uh, for example, UBFS images or raw images, uh, for example, block devices uh, or entire partitions. Um, it can change the U-boot environment. Uh, it can write single files and uh, there are other possibilities not listed here, but uh, it can handle uh, a great uh, variety of options. Um, the other positive thing is that it can fetch your update files from different sources. So can, you can pick the f update file from local storage, from our remote file servers, for example, FTP server, HTTP server. Um, you can provide your own built-in uh, web server. So you have a simple web page where you can upload uh, the firmware or the update file for your device like you do, uh, for example, on router devices. And finally, you can connect, as I said before, to a remote ma update management platform. Uh, another interesting thing 
of course, which is very important when you manage update files, is that it has uh, the ability to sign the update files and check uh, that signature, and um, you can encrypt the update files. So this is how an update file uh, is, is made. So as I said before, it's a CPU archive, and it has uh, as the first file of the archive, um, a software descriptor file, which basically uh, lists the components of those update files and how you want to treat them. So for example, here we have um, a partition that we want to flash in this, um, in this device. So we flash it in this storage. And we have a script that manages uh, for example, pre-installation and post-installation actions. Um, uh, an interesting thing is how it manages um, uh, the verification of the update files. So only the software description file, which is the descriptor of the update, uh, is signed. So. Um, but the software description can, it's not, okay, this is an example. The software description contains hashes for your files. So if you can trust the software update description, the software update description, you can also trust the hashes that are in there. And if you check the hashes, then everything is verified. Um, as I said before, you can also encrypt images. So uh, if you want to protect the content of your update file, that's something that software updates already provides. Uh, when we started um, experimenting with the software update, uh, we used our workpacks.io platform um, because we wanted to provide a simple way to update the device. Um, in this e experiment, which actually is in production now, um, we created a small uh, update system, which is a new boot image. And we put there uh, both the kernel and the RAM disk. So we stored the recovery system in unpartitioned space. So before the partition table, uh, sorry, after the partition table, but before the start of the first partition. So you can have this recovery system even if you, by example, wipe your partition table. Of course, if you wipe even the space where the recovery is, um, you will lose any, uh, all the system. But this is a good example of how you can uh, use it even if you destroy your partition table. Um, I forgot to say that if we want to do the system in action, yeah, we have a technical showcase uh, in a couple of hours. So just here outside. Here outside. Um, so the second piece that we were missing was uh, a good remote ab update management platform. And uh, we found a good solution with Eclipse IoT, um, or like Eclipse Hockpit because um, it is in the, an independent project and it has a very good architecture to replace um, some pieces. So if you want to customize it your way, it's a very good platform. So the, the fundamental features of updates, um, the update server component of Hawkbit is um, the device and software repository management, the artifact content delivery, and the management of software updates and rollouts. So uh, the back end has these features. Um, there's, anyway, a user interface available, which you can replace, uh, and you can write your own. But there's one that comes by default. There are management APIs to manage uh, users, groups, and tenants if you want to uh, divide your customers in uh, multiple data sections. And of course, it has protocols and uh, interfaces to uh, talk to the device. So device, and the device has a 
clearly def defined protocol to to talk to Hawkbit. Um, I don't want to go into the details, but for example, uh, you can replace some components. Here, for, uh, for example, we have replaced MongoDB as an ob object storage with Amazon S3, S3. So you can just write the simple piece of code that is missing and you customize it, customize it your way. Uh, another positive thing is that you can scale and be fault tolerant. So if you want to uh, grow while the number of devices that you are managing grows, uh, it's really simple to scale up. Okay, um, I'll skip this one because we have a video about that, but uh, Hawkbit is also very good at managing rollouts, so dividing um, your devices in groups. So if you want to, uh, for example, just 100 devices uh, run a beta test software and the other 10,000 devices run the production software, you can apply the update just to those beta devices, which is what you want to do generally. Or if you want to divide um, by location or uh, any grouping that you might be thinking of, you can do. So there are several metadata that you can manage in Ockbit. So uh, what w did we add that was not existing before? Um, we created um, an Android-like way to manage uh, updates on embedded Linux. So uh, here are some of the new components. So uh, the software update already existed, but we fit it into, the system, into our update factory architecture. Um, we wrote uh, an Android application, which is actually an Android service to connect to Hawkbit. Um, we have implemented a user management and tenant management uh, server. And as I said before, we have customized artifact repository management and metadata repository management because we brought them to Amazon AWS. So on the embedded Linux side of things, we had some changes. Uh, we implemented the single mode uh, in the way that Android does. So we set up the device to cloud communication. We uh, tweaked the bootloader coordination. Uh, we added a new recovery partition, a recovery boot script, a recovery RAM disk, and we made sure that the update installation feedback is provided to the cloud when your update is done. OK, so here is how it all works. So. Uh, for example, you start with your regular OS, so you have your boot partition, you have the rootFS that has software update running as a daemon, and software update is configured, so set up to connect to your update server, and it has the device ID and the name of the customer or, uh, in general, the tenants. And when the, your system connects to uh, Update Factory, it gets notification of updates that you set in the Hawkbit server. So uh, when you decide that from a web interface you apply an update, um, the software update will receive that notification, or better, software update will look uh, periodically to Hawkbit and will download the dot sw file, which is the name of your uh, update file. When you have everything ready, uh, you just reboot to recovery, and the RAM disk that is there have, has everything to install your software and go back to the uh, main regular OS. So uh, what we changed um, in the configuration 
of the daemon is that we added the option to just download the files. Uh, by default, software updates uh, just installs immediately what you downloaded. So, um, if for, for example, Hawkbit uh, tells the device that there's one update, it just goes, downloads the file, and installs it immediately. Why well, we wanted to store them in a special place. So we added this option. The, the patches are not upstream yet, but you can find them in our meta update factory layer. Uh, the other thing that we, the, that we had to deal with is uh, that um, there's no easy way, uh, and there's no solution that fits every device to uh, use, uh, to switch to an update mode. So uh, if we want to go to recovery, we need a solution. Of course, every board can have his own solution, but um, we implemented it that way. So we looked at the distribute GMD um, way of setting up the, the U-boot environment, and we changed the way that um, the boot partition is selected. So we basically run a command before the usual distribute GMD command, and we, if the regular OS has set the boot mode variable to update, then we tell the system, okay, you should go to the third partition and look there. Otherwise, you just do the regular uh, boot mode. Uh, another thing that we added in our uh, Yocto layer is um, the ability to create th uh, this special recovery partition. So um, now Yocto has WIC support. Uh, so you have the ability to just add uh, a line in your descriptor file which describes the partitions that are in your system. And, uh, but we had to create a new plugin called, called Files Copy uh, to populate the contents of the partition. Um, we also had to add uh, an FS tab entry so we could mount the, the recovery partition uh, directly from the, uh, from the main regular OS so that you can save the update files there. Okay, we also had to, of course, tell the boot script that it needs to load the recovery RAM disk and we had to uh, up add some file system utilities, but the main works come from meta software update layer and because this uh, single uh, RAM disk, uh, single image RAM disk is already provided by, by that layer. Uh, and of course, when it's all done, so you have, have applied you know, the update and we will see a demo in just a second, um, you uh, the software update demo reads the use state bootloader variable and provides feedback to Hawkbit. So he, does it work or does it not work? So what we want to add is support for other, other boards, um, a way to uh, start recover manually. So if, for, for example, your internet connection is broken and you want to update from USB, um, a way to separate the the update files in a different partition. For example, Android saves the update files in the cache partition. And we also want to have the ability to update the recovery OS just from the regular OS. So you have at least one of those working, which is not a full back, but it helps in case of problems. So, um, the main target here was having uh, uh, an embedded uh, an embedded Linux system that was behaving like Android. So we wanted to have good integration with Yocto, and we wanted to provide remote management as a service, and we wanted to have the freedom to write almost anywhere on our embedded device. 
Uh, so here in the slide, you will find some links. You can download them. And I want to show you um, yeah, a video. OK, so uh, this is a video of Hawkbit and the device working together. So it's an overlay of, of the device. Let me briefly uh, show you how the interface of Hawkbit is. Uh, so in this panel, you have the list of devices connected. We don't have any device yet. Here you have the updates that you are um, that you have provided and then you want to install and here is uh, the action history of what is going on with your device. Oh, sorry. Okay, so here you can see uh, that uh, we are missing a couple of things that we will have after the update. For example, we are missing this command here, so no information about the update factory. We are at version 1.0, and now you can see that we get the notification that software update has connected to Hawkbit. So a new target device has been created. You apply the update to your device. You confirm, so you select how you want to update, uh, apply that update, and you get the assignment is ready. So the next time that software update will connect to uh, Hawkbit, it will find that there's an update available. So here you are. It has downloaded the file, and now the update is running. And we will reboot into the, into the update mode. Uh, let me see if I can stop it. OK. Yeah, uh, you can see here that we have changed the bootloader, and update mode is now selected. So we are running a special recovery system. So now the recovery system will install that those update files, will tell us that they have been flashed successfully. So uh, yeah, we have changed some web pages, but also the OS version, install the update factory info binary, and we are now returning to the main OS. So as soon as the boot is completed, you will see that um, here the device, this is an embedded Linux uh, serial console, uh, the device will tell Hawkbit, OK, I'm done. So uh, you will see a green tick here. OK, it's going on. Should be ready in a couple of seconds. Here you are. And yeah, now here you are, the, um, the feedback provided to the server. And you can see that now the binary is installed. So we have information about update factory. So we know which server we are connected to. And we will have also a quick demo about rollouts. So here you are, uh, how you manage, for example, installing on different countries um, in different groups. Here you select how you, uh, the update that you want to apply, uh, the group of devices. Of course, I have already created the metadata to divide devices into groups. Uh, here you can see that we select an avoid an advanced group definition, so we select the devices located in Germany and call that group Germany. And we have selected another group, which is devices in Italy. And you can see that we have split the devices in two groups. So you have now your rollout, which is Europe 2, ready. And we start the rollout. And so only the first group, which is made in of one made of one device now, um, is started. So we go back to the list of devices, and we see that the first one has started. The other one is scheduled, but it's not already going. So uh, we 
go back to the rollout management, and here we can have update on the status of uh, the installation. So basically, in a couple of seconds, you will see that the group of devices here in Germany has finished. Uh, here you are. And as soon as this is completed, so Germany is done, you start in Italy. This is an example um, that shows that you can set error thresholds. So if you, for example, deploy an update to 100 devices, you can start with just 10 devices. And if, for example, 10% or 20% fail, you can just block the next group. So you don't want to, um, yeah, you don't want uh, to apply a broken update to all the devices. You can just start with a small group and check everything is fine there. So yeah, I am finished. I just want to thank everybody in the team. Um, so everybody in Kinetics, uh, Eric Nelson, also Gary Bisson, Gabriel Howe, Amit Pundir, and everybody that is working on the on software update, uh, Stefano, and on Hawkbeat on the Eclipse IoT Foundation, and also my daughter for the drawing. <laughs> So, yeah, if you have any question, just raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, the microphone. So, the first question, I have not understood why you need to improve uh, uh, everything for the uh, manual update because uh, a local update is already in, uh, inside the soft update. So updating from a USB or from a local storage is uh, already part uh, of soft update mainline. Maybe you think something different. Okay. Uh, the second question is, uh, uh, from I see from log uh, that uh, really you take the file, the SW file, you store locally, but when nothing is running in soft update, when it is restarting, the verification is done after rebooting the system. Yeah. This can be quite dangerous uh, if uh, some, someone change also one byte inside the SWU. The system reboots, uh, try to install, and soft update uh, before or later will find that uh, something is wrong, that is corrupted or was changed. So the SVW is not uh, uh, authenticated, verified, and uh, this can break uh, your device because after that you are still in uh, the RAM disk, so you can put another software with a soft update, but uh, you have no communication anymore with uh, the OCP server. Uh, a proposal could be that uh, in, uh, we implement some kind of dry run in soft update. So that uh, you get the SWU file, you go run uh, completely in the soft update chain, uh, but without installing anything. So let's say uh, at the end of the file, it's just copied, but uh, uh, all handlers are running uh, and uh, the, the verification, the decryption is done because also you can have an error in during the decryption. So you are sure that after the boot, uh, your software should be really installed. Okay. Um, so I will start with the second question. Um, yeah, so you are absolutely right. Uh, that was for the demo, so for the video. Uh, but of course, uh, as we have seen here, uh, Android has APIs to verify package signatures, so update files before reinstalling, and, that, and that's what we want to do also in update factory. So it's something that for sure we want to implement. And the other thing was um, about uh, installing in with a USB. Um, it's probably uh, what we um, we wanted to do to have some kind of factory restore. So uh, when we were when I was talking about the warp, uh, we wanted uh, some solution that we, uh, was some kind of an alternative to doing a factory restore. So it's something that, that you can use only on 
that you want to use only in very special situations. Uh, I don't know why if I have answered your question, maybe we can talk later, um, because I see that we have just four, four minutes. Uh, if there are other questions, we have a couple of minutes, but I think that the time is almost done. Okay. Um, if I saw it correctly, you're downloading the update to a cache partition uh, so the rescue system can read it from there. Um, in my experience, I'd expect that the, some of the space for the recovery partition and the cache partition is usually enough to just have a complete copy of the root file system as well and then just use a AB image system. Okay, uh, I don't have the slides anymore, but yeah, actually uh, we want to implement both. So you just have the option to uh, use both the recovery and the cache partition. We actually put that in the design, but act at the moment we just use the recovery partition. So the recovery partition has both the RAM disk and the storage of the update files. But uh, of course, if you have other storages available, uh, so. Uh, I think that he wants to come up here for his speech. Um, so uh, if you have other uh, available options, uh, yeah, you can use them. And if you separate the single uh, copy, so the recovery RAM disk from, from the rest of the, uh, of the system, it is good because you have no fall fallback. Uh, I think we should close. So thanks, everybody. And if you have questions, just come here and ask. <laughs>